Hi, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, yeah, so if you haven't met me, my name is John Huerta. I have the good fortune of being a postdoc in the beautiful city of Lisbon. And before that, I had the good fortune of being a student of John Baez, which is how I ended up doing higher structures in mathematical physics. But even though I was a student of John Baez, I also do a bit of string theory, which is why I'm going to talk about M theory today. But I just do a bit. I'm really a mathematician, and this is a mathematics talk. So let's get started. Here's a picture of an artist's conception of the superpoint. As you can see, it's, it's one point with some infinitesimal fuzz around it. And the reason for that is, is that r0 slash 1 has one odd coordinate, theta. And because it's odd, theta squared is equal to 0. So a power series terminates immediately in this variable. And in essence, this means that theta should be infinitesimal, which is why we have this picture where it's one point with an infinitesimal neighborhood. We're going to look into the superpoint using the tools of homotopy theory. And inside the superpoint, we'll find all the super Minkowski space times that show up in string theory and M theory, going up to dimension 11. And then, after that, we will find the strings, D brains, and M brains themselves, thanks to the work of Fiorenza Sati Schreiber, specifically the brain bouquet. So, here is a quick summary of pictures of what we're going to see. We're going to start with the super point down here, and then we're going to do a repeated mathematical process of extension, getting all of the space times up to dimension 11. And then out of those 10 and 11 dimensional space times, we'll get ex additional extensions, which are related to string theory and the M2 brain. And on top of those, we have even more extensions which are related to uh, the D brains and the M5 brain. And this picture is called the brain bouquet. It starts at the trunk with the super point, and then it goes up and blossoms into string theory and M theory. Um, that's what I'm going to tell you about today, although mostly my job here is to tell you about the trunk. Um, so let's get started. First, because I have M theory in my title, I have to tell you a little bit about what M theory is. And there are some actual experts in this audience who know a lot more about M-theory than I do. But for the people that don't know, and for just to put it in context for the people that do, in the mid-1990s, confronted with mounting evidence, the string theory community understood that they must study extended objects, E-brains and M-brains, of dimension greater than 1, dimension bigger than a string. Witten christened this topic M theory. The M arguably stands for membrane, but at the time this was a little controversial, so they decided to call it M theory. And here's a schematic picture, a very schematic picture of how M theory works, the M theory idea. This picture is due to Polchinski, and the idea is, well, oops, the idea is, ah, sorry, the idea is that M theory is actually this entire blob. This is one corner of the blob. It's called M theory for some reason. In this highly schematic picture, M theory, the whole blob, unites the five 10 dimensional string theories and 11 dimensional supergravity, which is not shown in this picture, although maybe it should be right here. And most directly, M theory is the limit of type 2a string theory, this node of the blob. It's a certain limiting process, leads you to um, M theory, which grows an extra dimension. That's the 11th dimension of supergravity. So, <clears throat> let's study this process. 10 dimensional space time becomes 11 dimensional space time. That's our claim, is that the type 2a string theory lives in 10 dimensional space time, and it becomes an 11 dimensional space time where M theory with its M brains lives. Infinitesimally, taking the tangent spaces of these space times, this means that R91, Minkowski spacetime of dimension 10, becomes R101, Minkowski spacetime of dimension 11. But everything inside has supersymmetry, so it's more correct to pass between the appropriate super spacetimes, and infinitesimally, that means the super Minkowski spacetimes, which I will describe what those are in a moment for those of you that don't know. 
So we're really passing between a super Minkowski space time called R91 slash 16 plus 16 bar. I would call this the type 2A space time, because it's where the 2A strings live. <coughs> and the M theory space time, R101 slash 32. And we'll see that this is a mathematically very natural and beautiful operation. It is a central extension. So, let me tell you what um, Super Minkowski space time is, or review it for you. So, RD slash N is the super version of RD, which is RD with this metric, where there's one minus sign and then a bunch of plus signs. That's Minkowski space time. RD minus 1, comma 1 slash N is a super Lie algorithm, meaning it is a super vector space. So it's Z mod 2 graded. Here and in subsequent slides, I will call 0 in Z mod 2 even and 1 in Z mod 2 odd. So the even part of this super vector space is just RD minus 1, comma 1 or Minkowski spacetime. That's the sense in which it's the super version of this. The odd part is another vector space that I'm calling boldface n. I'll tell you what this is in a minute. It's the spinner representation. Equipped, this whole, this whole super vector space is then equipped with a super Lie bracket, satisfying the Jacobi identity with some signs due to grade. This structure is dictated by representation theory. Specifically, this bracket is dictated by representation theory. Um, and it's the representation theory of the spin group. The spin group, spin d minus 1, comma 1, is the double cover of the connected Lorentz group, SO d minus 1, comma 1. Um, Minkowski spacetime is a representation of the spin group in an obvious way. But n is a choice of a real spinner representation of the spin group. And the bracket is the choice of a spin equivariant map. These are choices that go into defining every super Minkowski space map. But they're quite restricted choices. So, concretely, the bracket is only non-zero when you take two spinners and turn them into a vector. Vectors commute with everything. If the representation n is an irreducible representation, then because of Schur's lemma, this map is unique up to rescaling. If n is reducible, there is some more choice involved, but still not, it's still quite a controlled family of choices. Physicists usually write this packet using gamma matrices. These gamma matrices, by the way, are the actual choices. Um, they take the commutator of two <coughs> supercharges, Q, and it produces a gamma matrix contracted with a translation operator. They call it an anti-commutator in this case because Q, the Qs are odd. So this, this bracket is actually symmetric. Any questions so far? Okay. So remember that we're trying to understand this M-theory process where physically, it's a physics story where type 2A string theory that lives in 10-dimensional superspace time gives M-theory on 11-dimensional superspace time. And the M-theory hypothesis describes a physical process going from type 2A space time to uh, M-theory space time. And what is this process mathematically? <clears throat> so I've already told you the answer in words, verbally. It's a central extension. <clears throat> so given G, a uh, super Lie algebra, and omega, a skew map, a skew pairing on G into the reals, meaning, uh, which is a two cycle, meaning that it satisfies this certain algebraic identity then we could form the central extension where we had one additional generator to G, which is even and central, and the modified Lie bracket is given by this formula where if I 
take two elements of the original G and I bracket them, I get the original bracket plus a correction due to the cosine. And of course, C, being central, commutes with everything. So I define all of the brackets. <clears throat> In particular, 11 dimensional super space time is a central extension as a super Lie algebra of 10 dimensional super space time. And the two co cycle is this one. It's where I take, I'm taking two spinners and I'm pairing them using a gamma matrix that is the product of all the lower dimensional gamma matrices. And in, in this representation, the coordinates x, mu, and alpha, and theta alpha are the even and odd coordinates on two type two space time, type two A space time. <coughs> and note that this really is a two co cycle. It is left invariant as a form on the associated super Lie group. So when people say left invariant in these lectures, including people before me, they mean that I'm gonna take the associated Lie group structure or even infinity group structure and the form is left invariant with respect to that structure. And d of omega is zero by the naive obvious calculation. Moreover, it really does give 11 dimensional super space time by the <coughs> usual yoga of gamma matrices, which I won't go into, but that's, that's how you determine that the resulting space time <coughs> is 11 dimensional. So it was the gamma five to in just four dimensional space. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's the it's the volume elements in the Clifford algebra. It's gamma five in four in typical four dimensional notation. So it would work for any even dimensional case, right? Yes, that's right. In any even dimensional case, you should be able to take something like this and then go to the next next uh, level. Excuse me. Yes. How can I see from this picture that the Lorentz symmetry gets enhanced? Um, so I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. So every central extension comes with a projection map where I set this new generator C equal to zero. And in the following notes, I'll often write just this map to denote the central extension. For example, this projection that just eliminates this new dimension from 11 dimensions down to 10. So this story prompts a number of questions. One question is, what singles out this weird two cycle that I just wrote, just wrote down? You'll notice that I'm suppressing the spinner entities, <coughs> the alpha and beta now. I'm going to do that for the rest of this talk. That's typical physics notation. What singles out this two cycle among other potential two cycles on 10-dimensional spacetime? And the answer is that it's invariant under the spin group. <coughs> what are any other dimensions of spacetime? We've seen that the eleventh dimension of spacetime is due to a central extension. Are any other dimensions due to the central extension? And the answer is all of them. This is our main result. So at the most extreme, we could start with a super point r0 slash 1 and study its central extension. So let me tell you what the super point is. It's a super vector space, which is just r in odd degree and nothing in even degree. It has no Lie bracket. It has no metric. It has no spin structure. But we will discover these structures through the central <laughs> extension process. It has exactly one two cycle. So I said it has no Lie bracket, but actually the Lie bracket is zero. And this expression is a two cycle with respect to this zero Lie bracket. And extending by this two cycle, I get a super Lie algebra, R1 slash 1, called the super line. And this is already something that's relevant to physics because this is the world line of the super particle. But can we find more dimensions of space-time from the super point? Um, and we can. The process that we're going to use to do this is called maximum <coughs> invariant central extensions. 
And note that Ur is called this universal invariant higher central extension. There are good reasons to use universal instead of maximal, but I'm still stuck with maximal for the moment. And it's, in essence, it's a game with two moves. We can extend by all two cycles. That's the maximal part. We can extend by all two cycles, satisfying a suitable invariance condition. This invariance condition will answer your question. And we can double the number of spinners. I'm going to allow myself to just double the number of spinners freely. This will lead us from the super point up to 11 dimensional space time and beyond. So we want that suitable invariance condition to be invariance under the spin group. Lorentz invariance is what rules this game. But we don't have a metric because we're starting with the super point. It has no metric. Zero Lee bracket, no spin structure. So how do we get around this first roadblock? And the answer is with a proposition that is probably folklore, but we went ahead and proved it. Um, that for a super Minkowski spacetime, R D slash N, its connected automorphism group consists of rescalings, the spin group and a new group called the R group, which is the part of the automorphism group that acts trivially on the Minkowski spacetime part. And using this result, we can recover the spin group by considering the automorphisms of the bracket alone. That's the answer to your question, is that once you have the bracket, you essentially have the metric. At least you have its symmetry. So let's, start, let's play this game and start climbing the dimensional ladder. First, I will double the number of fermionic dimensions. I started with r0 slash 1, so I'm going to go to r0 slash 2. And I will write this operation as a double arrow for doubling the number of fermionic dimensions and because it's actually a push out if you speak that categorical language. Now, R0 slash 2 has two odd generators, theta 1 and theta 2, and there are three two cycles, wedging the first gen, wedging d theta 1 with d theta 1, etc. These three are cocycles, and they form a basis of all two cocycles. But how do you pass from R0 1 to R0 2? Um, so, this is a mathematical operation that one can perform called called forming the push-out. What is that? Uh, it just means that... Uh, <laughs> so push-outs are, are a way of... It's a, so set, in set theory, a push-out is called an intersection. Uh, and all that's fine, but how, what do you do here? What is your push-out diagram? The push-out diagram is R01 going to... That means direct product in this case. Yeah, in this case, it is the direct product. <laughs> so that means you simply start from R02. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm starting with R01. And I'm allowing myself to take direct products. Oh, okay. <laughs> in this case. Okay. But, in, but in, in other cases where we have, so the point of this push out is that if we have a, if we. Because to get a cycle, you need to start from two. Let me see. Yeah. If, we have, if we have some even dimensions, the point of this push out is that I want those to stay, to stay constant. So if I have r3 slash 2, I want to be able to double and get r3 slash 4. You'll see that in a second. That's the point of the push-out. The push-out, yeah, I said it was um, intersection. It's actually union with intersection. I'm allowed to have an intersection that has to be fixed. Yes, and it's five-bit progress. Yeah, co No, co So the diagram is the bosonic part of the Muslim process, but then goes into its super part, and then you can take that. So you keep the bosonic part and double the first. Yeah, you throw away the, so yeah, in the diagram, you throw I away want the to argue with some product. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, that's another question. Yes. Uh, so the DT does an even value, right? Because Which one? DT does even. D theta? No. Because T does odd, then DT does should be even. No, it's bigraded, actually. What? So, um, on the Durham complex, the Durham complex is bigraded. So it's, it's odd, comma, so it's one, 
comma odd. So but the d theta 1 match d theta 2 is equal to minus d theta 2, d theta 1 or is equal to plus d theta 2. <laughs> so then, all right, so then you have, <coughs> you have that plus one, of that one, and you have the odd odd. So, yes, wedging those particular ones together, it commutes. So this is why I spent some time discussing that there's these two grading conventions, the Deline convention and the Bernstein convention. A priori everything is bi-graded, but in the Bernstein convention you produce, and that's what you're thinking of, this parity grading, and with respect to that parity grading, it's even. Yeah. It's just a wedge product, but what is a wedge product in the two graded station, yeah? Yeah, but there are two different ways to handle the. Yeah, handle but that's the a size. wedge, wedge, not symmetric product, not not the symmetric product in the pair. It's the graded wedge product. That's right. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's perfectly ordinary. You have to decide how you're going to let the two gradings interact, which is which is Urza's point here. But but once you decide that, everything is determined. Yeah, it's clear. And, and determined case. and and normal, familiar. In your case, it's just exterior product is that the graded space. Yes, that's right. So now something, uh, so when I double the number of dimensions, double the number of odd dimensions, I extend by all the new tuple cycles. In other words, take maximal extension. I get a super vector space that has three even dimensions and two odd dimensions. Now something at this stage remarkable happens. A metric appears. We didn't put it in, but if you look at the automorphism group of the resulting super Lie algebra, you see that it's rescalings times the spin group in three dimensions with signature 2, 1. So thanks to this metric, we can look at the spin invariant tuku cycles on what I will now denote as R2, 1 slash 2. There are none, because the only spin group invariant map from spinner tensor spinner to reals is anti-symmetric, which is not the right symmetry for a tuco cycle in odd variables. So <clears throat> to get more, to increase my supply of co-cycles, I'm going to double the number of spinners again. And once I do that, there is precisely one spin invariant tuco cycle, and extending by it, gives three-dimensional super space-time. That metric is not a choice, once again, because of this theorem, that the automorphism group determines the spin group. In this case, we have some R symmetries as well. And at this stage, there are no further spin-invariant two-cycles. So, yes, please. Uh, so the signature came from uh, the spinner, right? Um, at what stage? It took from a one from the fact that you had grass on the uh, so this so um, the signature came from this coincidence that SL two R is the same as spin two comma one. So because because there's no structure being put in here um, at this sorry. Where are we? Yeah. Because there's no structure being put in here. The, auto, the full automorphism <laughs> group of this algebra, R3 slash 2, is, is GL2R. It's just the, it's just the any linear transformation of the spinners will induce an automorphism. And the, um, the semi-simple part of that is SL2R, which is the same as the spin group. But then how do we get uh, Euclidean signature SOD? SOD. Yeah, I don't have a I don't have a story. This is this is only about uh, Lorentz theory. Which has to be the right one, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because there's the, Chris Hall's got these, these multiple time theories that are also consistent with super symmetry. Are you gonna are you gonna get to them? <coughs> Am I gonna get to the I multiple think time think for a bunch ideas? of compact complexified. No, yeah, it doesn't. So that I want us to I want us to talk about that and actually figure out what's going on before we incorporate it into my research stuff. But the double sum is there. It's but you need to get the S into R S. So that means some choice, actually choice of some volume uh, error form or something that is preserved. Yeah, there has to be there has to be a choice that eliminates the rescaling. And this the will give you 
But you can, you can think of this choice, you can also think of this choice very algebraically as just taking the semi-simple part of this reducible algebra, of this reductive Lie algebra. The automorphism group, the automorphism groups, automorphism Lie algebra is reductive, <coughs> and you can take its semi-simple part. Yeah, but this is the choice. Geometrical is the choice. It is, yes, absolutely. So, where were we? So we, um, so now we're at four dimensions. There are no additional two go cycles that are invariant under the spin group. So we can double the number of spinners again to improve our supply of two go cycles. And now there are exactly two spin group, spin invariant two go cycles. Surprise, there are more than one. So I get to six dimensional super space time. And again, this metric with its signature is not a choice, although the <coughs> scale is a choice. <coughs> Yes. Is there a reason why you take uh, the extension with respect to all the cycles, or just go faster, or you could imagine? Um, no, you could you could do it by stages and and go and go pass through five dimensions. Okay. You should. You can. It's just that the most like, how do you pick that co cycle that you're going to do the extension by? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's it breaks the symmetry a little bit. That's why that's why we call this universal yeah. maximal central extension. But if you do just with just one consecutive, you can certainly five get five dimensions. One. You can do it consecutively also, yes. If you do it consecutively, you will eventually end up in the same place. But if you, if you really get R for, Sorry? you will really get the supersymmetric space time in five dimensions. Yeah, it would be the supersymmetric space time. So the two cycles uh, are the gamma of five and uh, the R group? Uh, that sounds right. Like the, the R group generator paired with the spin, yeah. Actually, no, isn't the gamma 5 the R group generator? I think it is. That's all right, it's in the part. Um, anyway, yes. So, now we have a choice of two different ways to double the number of spinners. We have a type 2A <coughs> and a type 2B because there are two different kinds of spinner representations in six dimensions. We could have a pair of, we could have a pair where they are of opposite priority, that's called type 2A, just imitating the terminology for string theory, and a pair where they're the same priority, that's I'm calling type 2B. There are no spin group invariant two cycles in type 2B, but on type 2A, there are four. So we can jump immediately to 10-dimensional space-time with 16 supercharges. And again, this metric is not a choice because of this theorem about the automorphism group. At this stage, there are no further spin group invariant Tuco cycles because I've extended by all of them. Um, and now, in 10 dimensions, we again have this choice because there are two different chiralities of spinners. So I can, ex I can double the number of spinners into a type 2A super space time or a type 2B. There are no spin invariant two co cycles in type 2B, once again, but on type 2A, there is one. And this is the one I started my story with. So I can go from 10 dimensions up to 11. In summary, we proved the following theorem that if we start at the super point and engage in this process of both doubling odd uh, dimensions and extending by all suitably invariant cocycles, spin invariant cocycles, where, where spin is defined using this automorphism group idea, then we get this full tower, starting from the super point and going up to dimension 11. And um, like I said verbally, <coughs> You can pass between all intermediate dimensions as well, and you get the super space. Yes? Does this terminate? Why does it go to uh, <laughs> keep on okay. going? That's, that's what we are, Bruce and I are talking about this now. We believe it does not terminate. No, but then you change the signature of the, the real part. Of the book, that's the part. Right, that's, that's the question that we are, we are thinking about. There are, yeah, I would say, I would say I'm not, I'm going to say I'm not confident in the answer to that question to give you the answer, yet, but we will, we will know very soon. Well, R10, 2, 64. Yes, exactly. No, it's 32, 32, that's the 
So this is our main result, that we can start with the super point and get, build this tower of super Minkowski space times, and there are essentially no choices involved except for the choice that eliminates this rescaling degree of freedom. Um, I can ask. Yes, please. Um, so so this is a statement about central extension for super large. It is. So it's, it's a statement about the super translations to the trees of space. But it is. About the super space times. Now, can you do that for the super Poincare the algebra? Does, does there exist a similar construction? Because I, I find it a bit strange that you just look at super translations and not at the rest of the super Poincare. Uh, I think that's a good question, and um, there should be something that you can do, but I'm not sure. I guess the cycles will sit on the translational part. The co-cycles do all sit on the translation part. And in fact, all of these co-cycles for, um, all of these co-cycles in the brain bouquet sit on the translation part. But the, the Lorentz group is there, or the screen group is there in the invariants. That's right. It's, it's not just center of sense, it's invariant center of sense. So the, the Lorentz group acts on everything. Acts on the, I mean, it's just what you want to see for a car time geometry. You want to model super gravity space times, you want to have a the model space, and the group acting on it. And that's precisely what this you can fuse this if you wish to swap on array, but in the end, you do want to, you want to form the coset again of swap on array mod spin to exactly find that decomposition. Right, you want to have some distinction, of course. Um, <laughs> um, it's a statement about the down shield. Yeah, that's what it's So, so now I want to extend this story to the story about strings and membranes. Can I ask before? Yes, so please. please. It's a related question. Uh, to which extent this scheme can be extended to, say, ADS geometry? Um, so all of this is at the infinitesimal level. So in a sense, this should be this should work for ADS, but it's just an infinitesimal approximation to ADS. Yeah, but this is a simple algebra, so that the ratio of homology is very very much different from Poincaré. Mm. There probably no home homology in this case, so uh, no. Finite dimensional, but yeah, finite dimensional. Yes. This infinite dimensional can show up. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. There's yes. a question which is related to that. The, the metrics that you have, I mean, is that not really just a metric of the tangent space? Um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't put in an arbitrary metric of the space time as I would say metrics, but indeed, because it just got a super yeah, again, it's, 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 it's infinitesimal, so it is it's a metric on the tangent space. That's right. So yeah. then you wouldn't see the difference with the ADS or whatever. Because at the moment, I've not got an actual metric of space time. Right, I've got a metric at one point. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and I also have this rescaling degree of freedom. But there is some work thinking about that, like due to how in supergravity. Thinking about conformal <coughs> notions. Of You've got to move from the tangent space onto the full space and get yes. it in the season. Yes, that's right. That's, that's right, but that's the idea of Cartan geometry, is to treat these as approximations of the full, the full geometry. Okay, so we have seen that the two cycles that I just described give central extensions. Um, and this is part of a very general story that the second chevalier eilenberg cohomology group of Lie algebras and super Lie algebras classifies all the central extensions of a super Lie algebra. So here's a question, what do the higher degree cycles in this cohomology theory, it's, it's graded, it has degrees higher than two, what did they classify? And there are two answers that I'm going to give you. One answer is uh, quite a remarkable answer due to physics, which is that invariant degree P plus two co-cycles on super Minkowski space-time specifically classify some P brains. Not all, but some. And the answer I'm going to give you mathematically is the reason that I'm speaking in this higher structures meeting, is that higher degree co-cycles classify extensions to L infinity algebras. Um, first, I'll tell you about the physical answer. The Lie algebra cohomology of Super Minkowski gives rise to particular P brains, which we call Green Schwartz P brains. And here's how you compute this. You write a generating set of left invariant forms. You've seen these forms before in Horace's talk and Hisham's talk, where um, 
where the bosonic directions are not the usual um, dx's, but they're modified by a theta term. And I, I should have put a d theta right there, typo. But the, um, the invariant ones are just the d thetas in the odd directions. And find the spin invariant combinations of these left invariant one forms. So for example, one could take the bosonic ones and wedge them with a gamma matrix to eliminate these um, Lorentz indices, and then wedge those, wedge that between two spinorial um, d thetas to get rid of the spinner indices. And this sits well, but the naive reasoning that this has no indices, it's invariant under the spin. This is a people of Shuko cycle if and only if it is closed. Do note that d of e is going to have d thetas in it. So being closed is a non-trivial condition. It's actually an algebraic condition on gamma matrices, often called, in some cases, called Fierce identities. And Fierce identities of this type only happen for special values of the dimension d, the choice of spinner representation n, and the choice of degree p. And if you plot these values, this is a plot of d against p, you see, you find what is called the old brain scan, where for each dot, there's one of these co-cycles, one of these mu p's is closed. And in fact, physically, for each dot, there is a theory of a p-brain. You can write down the action functional for a p-brain using the co-cycle as data in your construction. This old diagram is from a paper by Duff, right around the time that supermembranes started to be researched, apparently after the first 15 weeks of supermembrane research. But it's um, 30 years old. So this figure is called the old brain scan. It fails to show many examples of brains that people would find out are important later, such as the D brain and the M5 brain, black brains in supergravity, or solitonic brains, that's a synonym, synonymous, and brain intersections. So where can we find these? To answer, we will now use some homotopy data. So the brain scan co-cycles on RD slash N, it gives p plus 2 co-cycles, and we can extend the algebras by these p plus 2 co-cycles to get what I'm calling, just for now, the brain scan algebras. Because these two co-cycles, because these co-cycles are not two co-cycles, the resulting extensions are not super Lie algebras. They are super L infinity algebras. And I was going to tell you what that means. It's a Lie algebra up to coherent homotopy. But I'm going to skip it because I'm running out of time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very brief. So, so we get this picture where I have taken my Minkowski space times. I've taken co-cycles on them, and I've extended to L infinity algebras that I'm calling string two B, string one, string 2a, and m2 brain, just naming them by the theories that these co-cycles correspond to. And this is the first glimpse of the brain bouquet. Again, I have these projection maps where I set the new generator, whatever that is, equal to zero. So thanks to having these new algebras, these new L infinity algebras, the string L infinity algebras and the m2 brain L infinity algebras, we can find some of the brains missing from the brain scan. And to do this, um, yeah, so there are additional co-cycles on these L infinity algebras. I'm going to skip describing how they're computed, but there, are, there can be, now that I have new algebras, I can study their co-cycles, and there can be new ones. And some of these co-cycles, for example, the one that I've written here, correspond to the D brains and the M5 brain. So I can extend again by these 
cocycles. I can extend these L infinity algebras by these additional cocycles. And I get L infinity algebras corresponding to all the D brains, all the stable D brains in string theory, and the M5 brain. And this is part of the picture called the brain bouquet. Growing out of the superpoint, going into all of the Minkowski space times, and then from the Minkowski space times, the D brains and M5 brain emerging in the guise of L infinity algebras. All starting with the superpoint and studying it through the lens of homotopy theory. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, this is a very beautiful story. I just missed uh, how exactly L-infinity came about. So L-infinity came about because um, for the the string and M brains, they they have they are described by additional cocycles. Those cocycles actually become the West Sumido Witten terms for those three Schwartz actions. Higher cocycles. There used to be two cocycles Yeah, I said two cocycles, but now for the string, there's a three cocycle giving the West Amino Witten term is actually, actually if you take a potential of it to get the West Amino Witten term. And for the membrane, there's a four cocycle. So, and in general, for a P brain, there's a P plus two cocycle. And if I extend by a P plus two cocycle, I get not a Lie algebra, but an L infinity algebra. Higher cocycles give you higher. Well, I understand that. That's what you get. I mean, yeah. Previously, the algebra was essentially describing symmetry of, of super space or space that's right. and that's that's very important. That's why I find this extremely beautiful. Yeah. So but what is this an infinity algebra symmetry of? So there's still the idea that it's the symmetry of a kind of generalized uh, super space time. Um, this idea goes back to I think I have some references here. Who did this? Um, yeah, the geometry of brain, Chris Samomalakos, Ascaraga, Izquierdo, and Perez Bueno, the geometry of brains and extended superspaces, they had the idea that these L infinity algebras that you get are actually kinds of space time. And in this case, the L infinity algebra would be describing the symmetries of this generalized space time. And this idea is not a bad idea. If you look at maps, if you look using like Gerstreiber's technology at maps into these generalized space lines, then what you get, like a map into, let me describe this for a second. A map into um, a map into string 2B has two parts. It consists of a map into space time, and then a map into a higher degree thing that comes from the extension. And the map into the higher degree thing is actually describing a U1 bundle. It's actually the stack, the classifying stack of U1 bundles that you're mapping into. So, so mapping into this is like having a world volume that sits in space time with a U1 bundle on it, and that's exactly what a D brain is. Another way of saying this, uh, this if I may, John, yes, please. string to B is uh, the total space of the B field jerk over time to space time. And the uh, M2, what about M2, well, M2 brain is the uh, 11D space time, and then the two jerk, the C field two jerk over the total space of that. So the symmetries of that is the symmetries of the space time and the gauge symmetries of that form field. It's a bit like in general geometry. Right, and these, so these would be symmetries of this um, higher stacking space time. Yeah. Maybe related to this, it, it looks like that if you include these higher co-cycles, yes. then you're effectively including map frames and then coming up and then, then extending the algorithm to that, you generate the more. So, 
So in M theory, there's this story that if you condense D0 range on type 2A, then you get the M theory space time. Yeah. And that's that's exactly our idea here, is that extending by a co cycle is really condensing right. the brain. So now, so now you now you have M2 brain states, you have five brain states. Yes, that's right. And that's why we get eligibility algebras, which Jacob will talk about in the exceptional field theory. Mm -hmm. My exceptional field theories have got high dimensions, but they're not usual space time. Okay, interesting. I look forward to it. I mean, not seeing them. Yeah, in fact, uh, so in my last presentation, we this is, there's a, you can ask if I'm two brain, which has this Jervy extension of lambda space time. If there's an ordinary extension, right, an ordinary space time that still develops the post cycle. That turns out to be the super burden of fully down extended exceptional yeah. This is what Daria Frey called the, I get into already, the hidden, the hidden super group of the lambda and super gravity. But that was long before people said exceptional. But that's really their computation. Do you have an analog of U-duality here? I mean, I there is an analog of the dualities in the L infinity algebra story, and they, they tend to become L infinity algebra equivalences. Have you guys worked out U-duality? T-duality, definitely. Yeah, T-duality, yeah, not U-duality. Yeah, T-duality is there. Domenico will speak about that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Why, why only T-duality? Sorry, why only T-duality? Yeah. S duality. S duality. <laughs> so there are there are some dualities, and they're being they're in the process of being worked out. T duality is pretty well worked out.